Hello. Hi, folks. Hi. Oh my gosh. Big Man Con. So excited to be back. Um, well, I am so glad Pete has already come up a couple of times at the conference. I uh, hope everybody is just as excited as I am to talk about Pete today. I'm Anjana Vakil. You can find me at Anjana Vakil on Twitter. Um, and I'm really stoked to talk about Pete. Uh, so let's dive in. The slides are up on Observable, where I work as a developer advocate. And uh, I am really stoked that I think a lot of people already are familiar with Pete, but I hope for the folks that are new that this will be illuminating. So um, Pete Mondrian might be a name that you recognize, but if you don't recognize the name, I'm pretty sure you recognize his art. So he was a Dutch painter famous for doing these um, very, uh, very striking compositions, abstract paintings with large color blocks and, and lots of white space. And um, the question that we as intrepid programmers might be asking ourselves is, cool, 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 art is nice, but what if we could run a piece of art like this as a program? Uh, so this is exactly the question that um, David Morgan Marr posed when he invented the programming language called Pete, named after Pete Mondrian. So Pete is an esoteric programming language, or ESOLang, or ESOLang, depending how you pronounce it. Um, I think a lot of folks are, are uh, familiar with uh, ESOLangs, but in case you're not, that's essentially a language that's not intended for practical programming and getting work done, but rather for joy and excitement and exploration and learning and in many cases pushing the boundaries of our notions of computing and what programming even is. And so this is definitely the case um, for the language Pete where we are going to treat abstract art as the source code for programs. What does that even mean? How, what does the program look like in Pete? Well, here are some examples. Um, all of these are different ways that you can code a Hello World world program in, excuse me, in Pete. Um, so all of these programs print the output Hello World to standard out. Uh, and this animated one uh, has three different versions of ways you can, uh, you can color this program. So as you can see, they're all very colorful. They're made up of blocks of bright colors. And uh, we're going to see how we can execute images like this as code, thanks to the Pete interpreter. So how does Pete interpret these pixels, this, these pixel art pictures as programs? Well, it's all about colors. So uh, as we saw, Pete programs are made up of bright colors. Um, and this is the set of colors that can go into a Pete program. So we have the kind of rainbow color, six rainbow colors here, a lighter version and darker version of each, and then white and black, which are kind of special colors, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and so the... Uh, idea is that in a Pete program, and here we've got a, a very simple little 10 by 10 pixel uh, blown up program here. In a program, the blocks of a contiguous uh, group of pixels of the same color represent a piece of data, so an integer value. And that is going to be the number of pixels making up that block. So in this case, we've got a magenta block here, and you'll notice it has some holes in it. There's some black areas and other colors inside of it, but all of these pixels make up a contiguous area that has 33 pixels. So this is gonna be a magenta block of value 33. And then um, we have a dark magenta one here, which is, has uh, 11 pixels, so 10 here and then one more. There's also a couple more one pixel blocks of, of uh, dark magenta there, and so on and so forth for the different colors. Now, keep in mind, this is all about the, um, the contiguous series of blocks of, of pixels. So, for example, here we have uh, two different dark cyan blocks, one that has value five and one that has value one. They're separated by this white. Now, as I said, white and black are kind of special colors. White is essentially like a void. It's like a filler. It's kind of empty space. Um, and we're going to see what that means in a moment. And then black is essentially like a, like a stop. It's a, it's sort of a, it's also not a value, but it's more like the edge of a pro of the um, image. So essentially it, it's a no go zone. We'll see what that means in a moment. All right, so the way a Pete program is interpreted is thanks to the help of something called a direction pointer. The way the direction pointer works is when we start execution of a program, the direction pointer starts out in the top left pixel of the image, and it starts out pointing right. And uh, what it does is if it's in a color block area, it's going to try to move to the edge of that colored area, that, that same color block, 
that is in the direction that it's pointing. So in this case, to the right. So here it's gonna move from the top left corner, uh, five pixels over or to the fifth pixel over. Um, and this is, this is the rightmost edge of this magenta block. Then it's gonna try to move on from there into the next block. In this case, into this dark magenta one and so on and so forth. Now here, I don't need to move to the edge of the dark magenta block that I'm in because it's only one pixel wide. So I'm already at the edge. So I can go into the dark cyan, go into the next one, eventually the green and so on until I reach this light yellow block. Now here, the furthest edge in the direction the pointer is pointing is actually not here, but further down the image. It's gonna be this lower rightmost uh, pixel here. That's the furthest edge in the direction of pointing. So we jump down there. And now we've reached the edge of the image. So we can't go anywhere else, can't move on. So what the pointer does in that case is it turns 90 degrees clockwise. So it's gonna start pointing down. And then it's gonna move, sorry, we just jumped ahead a little bit. It's gonna move uh, to, the, to the edge that's furthest in the down direction. It hits the edge again of the image. So it has to rotate once more. It's gonna move again to the furthest edge. Now it's pointing left. So it's gonna move that way, which is this block over here. Now it's run into black, which as we said, operates sort of like the edge of an image. So it can't pass through the black area. It has to turn again and uh, move to the next, uh, the edge in the, in the new direction, which is now up. So it's going to move back up to this top pixel here, which again is the edge of the image. It can't move on um, from there. So it turns again, it turns again. But at this point it has done a full rotation in this light yellow block and it hasn't been able to get out. So it's stuck. And that is how we tell a Pete program to stop executing. So this means the program is over and execution is finished. Now we didn't look at this one, but the white pixels essentially are sort of empty space. So the pointer moves unhindered through any white pixels. Okay, so now how do we uh, take this pointer movement and turn it into doing something? Well, turns out that changes between one block of color and the next block of color, changes between those colors are actually corresponding to commands to the PEAT interpreter. So the colors are arranged in uh, two cycles. On the one hand, we have a hue cycle, which moves through the rainbow colors from red, yellow, green, cyan, blue to magenta, and then back to red and goes on in that cycle. And this is called the hue cycle. We also have the lighter and darker versions of each color, and that makes up another cycle called the lightness cycle, where we go from light to normal to dark and back to light. So if we're, um, let's say, moving out of a light red block and moving into a dark magenta block, that difference in colors is going to represent five steps in the hue cycle and two steps in the light cycle. And uh, the way that these steps work is the number of hue and lightness steps for a given color change corresponds to a command that the, the interpreter is going to run to actually do something. So in this case, if I were to go from light red to uh, dark magenta, that's gonna correspond to the out car command. And we're gonna see what that means in a second. Um, and keep in mind that these are not absolute, the color, like each color does not correspond to a particular command, but rather the difference between them is what creates a command. So if the color changes, if now I'm in a dark magenta block, then uh, moving to the light red color would be a subtract command or moving one step in the lightness cycle to light magenta would be a push and two steps in the lightness cycle to regular magenta would be a pop. Okay, so moving fast through all of this, but um, we're, we're not gonna have time to look at all of these commands, but what do these commands do? Let's take a look at a couple. What they do is they, tell the interpreter how to manipulate values on a stack. So a Pete program it runs by means of a stack which has integer values onto it. And each command uh, gives the program something to do with that stack. So for example, the push command says, okay, take the value, the number of pixels in the block of color that you just exited in that previous block and push that value onto the stack. Then we have a pop command that says, take whatever's on top of the stack and throw it out, take it off and throw it away. There are some commands like add, which assumes that there are at least two values on the stack and says, take those, take the top two values, remove them, add them together, and then push the sum as a new value onto the stack. There are also some more commands um, like uh, that, that have various operations like duplicate, for example, is one where we read the top value on the stack, and then we push another copy of it to uh, the top of the stack. We can also do input and output. So we can read from standard in with the in commands and without commands, we can 
take the top value on the stack and print it to standard out, interpreting it either as a number because everything on the stack is going to be integer numbers, or we can take that integer and interpret it as a character code and print the character that it represents instead of the number. So you can uh, check out the references in these slides for a link to um, uh, David Morgan Mark's uh, description of all of these commands. OK, so let's see how this works and try to run a program. OK, so we have our little, um, our little image here, a 10 by 10 image. And we know uh, how our color commands work now, and we know how our uh, pointer works. So let's put it all together. OK, when I start execution, the pointer starts out in the top left, as we saw before. It's in the magenta block, which has a value of 33. It moves to the edge of that magenta block. So it's still in the same block, this magenta 33. Then, as we saw, it moves into the dark magenta. Now, that difference from the previous colored magenta to dark magenta, that's a lightness step of 1 and 0 steps in the hue cycle, that corresponds to the push command. So it takes the previous value, this 33, and pushes it onto the stack. So now we have something on our stack. Started out as empty. Uh, OK, we keep moving into dark cyan. So now the difference between the uh, dark magenta that we were in before and the dark cyan that we're in now corresponds to that duplicate command. So what we've done is we've taken the, the previous topmost uh, value, which was that 33, and created a new copy, put it on the stack. So now we have two 33s on our stack. Then we're going to move into this green, where the difference between dark cyan and green, even though all these colors look totally different, the number of steps is, um, is, is going to be what corresponds to the next command we're going to do. And that is out as a character. So now what we've done, and let's just go back to see here, but we, we took the topmost uh, value. And when we moved into that green, that out command told us to print it as a character to standard out. And guess what character it made? An exclamation point. Oh my gosh, how unpredictable. Uh, <laughs> and then we move into this light yellow. And that difference is actually going to be the same difference as we saw from dark cyan into green. So we get that same out command and we print that uh, last 33 that we had there as another exclamation point. Now we're in our light yellow block again, and we saw how that goes. We try to move, we have to turn, we try to move, we have to turn, and so on and so forth, until we realize that we're stuck. We've retraced our steps, gone in a complete circle in this same block, and we can't get out. So we exit the program, and we are done. Bang, bang. So, oh my gosh. We did it. We saw Pete run. Now, this was a really simple program, but you can do anything in Pete that you can do with a computer. You could write an interpreter for an entirely different ESOLang, for example, which Matthias Ernst did uh, when he wrote a brainfuck interpreter in Pete. Like, oh my gosh. You could even uh, develop, Sergey Lewis developed an assembler to basically like compile to Pete and can create even more complex programs that way. This, what we're looking at, and it's very, it's very small here, but this is a text adventure game written in Pete. Amazing. So I think this is just like so cool that you can re like re really force your mind to expand in terms of the notion of what is a program? What could execution be? How could the act of programming be more like the art of programming? Huh? Huh? And um, I just think that that Pete is just such a great example of like bringing joy and excitement to programming. And so I am really happy that everyone has been excited about it. Thank you all for listening. And uh, I have some resources for you all in these slides, um, which you can find on observablehq.com slash at Anjana slash Pete minus bang bang con. So yeah, go check out the resources listed here to learn more about all of the details of Pete and see some other really awesome programs. There are some really great um, online tools excuse me, and interpreters, um, including an amazing web IDE called Master Pete's that uh, Riker Center alumna Gabrielle Sincadieu made, which uh, you can play around and make Pete programs and try them out with an interactive debugger. So go forth, play with Pete, enjoy, and I hope it brings you lots of excitement, surprise, and joy. Thank you.